Hi everyone, my name is Julien Martinelli. I am a third year PhD student, and today I will present a model learning approach to identify systemic regulators of the peripheral circadian clock. I will begin with a description of the problem and of the biological context. So, most biological functions in mammals display a 24 hour rhythm. These rhythms are called circadian rhythms, and they are generated by a hierarchical system called the circadian timing system which is composed of circadian clocks that can be found in each nucleated cell. In the suprachiasmatic nuclei is located what we call the master clock. It is an autonomous molecular oscillator with a period of roughly 24 hours that is synchronized back to a period of exactly 24 hours by external signals such as light, activity rhythms, or feeding patterns. Now, this master clock will entrain the peripheral clocks located in the different tissues of the organisms through physiological signals such as hormones. And it's precisely those peripheral clocks that will induce rhythmicity in key intracellular processes such as the cell cycle or the metabolism. Actually, in this picture are contained multiple sources of individual variability. For starters, we are not exposed all to the same external factors. Some of us will experience jet lag, working night shifts, and we do not all eat at the same hours. In brief, we all have different external cues. Furthermore, there is also a variability at the circadian timing system level, for instance, with a different uh, genetic background for each of us. In the end, the rhythmicity that can be found in intracellular processes is individual. Let's sum up. Circadian rhythms induce a time-dependent response to treatments such as chemotherapy or radiotherapy. Optimizing the time of treatment so as to minimize treatment toxicity, for instance, is called chronotherapy. Now, what I just said is that those circadian rhythms are individual, so that a long-term goal would be to personalize chronotherapies, meaning to find an optimal time of treatment that is individual. But where are the data available to do so? Well, this brings us to today's aim, where we will aim to find the link between systemic regulators, such as temperature, and the cellular peripheral clock that induces rhythmicity in the processes of interest. Indeed, the only data that we have to personalize are data that you can acquire through wearables, such as sensors, smartwatches, or also from daily questionnaires or smart scales. Such data can be temperature, food intake, or saliva hormones from saliva samples, or activity rhythms. And to investigate these links, we will focus on mice, which is an organism on which we have data at the systemic level and at the cellular level. Let's have a look at those data. At the systemic level, we have the time series profile of five variables, for instance, temperature or melatonin, and this in four mouse classes, two strain and two sex. You can observe differences class-wise. For instance, if you look at the green curves, the activity curves, you'll see that the amplitudes are higher uh, in female mice compared to male mice. And you can find other differences as well. So that's at the systemic level. And at the cellular level, we have the gene expression profiles of three core clock genes, DIMAL1, PER2, and RIVERB alpha. Again, you can observe some class-wise differences, for instance, in terms of mean level, if you look at RIVERB alpha. Now the aim is to infer the links between the systemic variables that I've just shown and the peripheral clocks, which is described by the, these three variables. So in order to do that, we choose to take a systems biology point of view. Namely, we took advantage of the literature on the peripheral circadian clock at the cellular level, and we encompassed the mechanism of clock gene expression into a mechanistic model. This is the model that we designed, and it is based on ordinary differential equations. In this model, the dynamics of gene expression reads as the following. There is a degradation term with rate alpha, a transcription term 
with basal level Vmax and a transcription function that depends on a parameter vector gamma and on the protein levels of the involved protein in the regulation of the gene. For instance, in the case of PMAL1, it is regulated by a reverb and ROR so that the kinetic looks like this. Now that we have encompassed all information into a mechanistic model, the problem becomes can we infer the links of the systemic regulators directly into the model? To investigate these links, we make the following first hypothesis. We suppose a multiplicative control of systemic regulator Z on gene transcription, meaning that the gene expression dynamics, when exposed to external signals, reads as the following. We still have the cellular contribution that I just presented, but now, the action of regulators on gene transcription is captured by this unknown function f. f will represent what are the regulators involved and with what magnitude. Using this expression, we are able to derive an analytic form for the unknown function f. And this can be done for all clock genes where we have data, namely bimal1, pair2, and reverb alpha. Furthermore, if I discretize this uh, differential equation, I am now able to plug in my systemic regulator's data Z, as well as my clock gene expression data for each mouse class. Thus, I obtain an approximation of the unknown function F, and this approximation is named Y, and I will uh, call it a residual. So actually, now we can see the problem of uh, identification of systemic regulators as a regression problem, where using as input the systemic regulator Z, we want to predict the residuals Y, and by doing so, we will obtain an explicit form for the unknown function F. And that's what we are really after in this case. Usually, a regression problem can be solved by minimizing uh, some uh, loss between the data and the model over some function space. And in this case, we will minimize the square loss in the space of linear functions. What we just need to do before solving this regression problem is to compute the values of the residuals y so that we can predict them with the systemic regulators. These values depend on the gene expression data that we already have, as well as on the parameters and the protein levels of the circadian clock model that we designed, which is not yet fitted to any data. Values for the parameters and protein levels of the circadian clock model should be independent of the action of systemic regulators. Therefore, we need to place ourselves in a setting where the action of systemic regulators is constant over time. Such a setting can be found if you use in vitro hepatocytes data, for instance. In this setting, indeed, temperature will be constant. There is no activity, so it's constant equal to zero. Same for the hormones etc. We can consider that in this case, the action of systemic regulators is constant. And we found such a data set and we fit our model to it. The result is the following. We see that our model nicely fits the data. And more importantly, this gives us the estimates that we need to compute the residuals and then solve our regression problem. Moreover, we actually obtained multiple parameter sets that all lead to the same fit of the data, and we applied perturbations with Gaussian noise on all these parameter sets to obtain multiple residual trajectories that will all be predicted. Now that we can compute the residuals, let's get back to solving our regression problem. Reminder, we want to predict the residuals Y by using a weighted combination of systemic regulators. Just a few guidelines that we ensure before going to the fitting. We want the active regulators of the model to be the same class-wise. Only the magnitude of the weights can be allowed to change from one class to another. For instance, if I have the following model for mouse class 1, then this one is not allowed for mouse class 2, but this one is. Next, we wanted to take into account the fact that a regulator might not act directly on gene expression, but perhaps through intermediate species. To that end, we define integral regulators, 
which is just the time integral of a systemic regulator. And we, end, and we add the, the second constraint, a regulator cannot be found with its integral regulator in the same model. This is just to ensure that among a model, a variable uh, cannot act both in a direct and indirect manner in the expression. So for instance, this model would not be suitable, but this one is. Actually, with these constraints and the final definition of the problems, we see that the combinatorics is quite small. We only have 10 variables, so we can actually perform an exhaustive fitting of all models and compare their performance. Conditionally to the hypothesis of a control on gene transcription, what you are seeing now is the error that I will explain of the best models as a function of the number of regulators that they include. This error is simply the mean squared error between the trajectories and the model. Moreover, since we normalize both the input and the output, this error is a percentage of an explained variance. Then, to obtain the final error that is shown here, we just take the mean across trajectories and mouse classes. So that, for instance, this red dot means that the best model trying to explain the control on reverb alpha transcription with only two regulators left unexplained roughly 20% of the variance. Actually, using Fisher test for nested models when it's possible, or the balance between degrees of freedom and error degrees, we obtained the following results. If we assume a linear control on the transcription, BIMAL1 and FAIR2 associated trajectories are well fitted using only two-term models. Conversely, we found no linear control for reverb alpha transcription. And using the same method, we concluded that for both three genes, there were no linear controls on gene mRNA degradation. Now that we know that the control on BIMAL1 and FAIR2 transcription are well explained using only two-term models, let's have a look at those models. This plot displays the error in increasing order of all two-term models trying to explain either the control on BIMAL1 transcription on or on PER2 transcription. The emptiness and the colors of each square tell you what are the components of each two-term model. For instance, it seems that the best two-term models trying to explain the control on PER2 transcription is made of a direct action of food intake and an indirect action of temperature. The bar plots below actually tell you what are the key components, the key regulators among those two-term models, meaning the ones that are uh, used in the best two-term models. And we see that food intake and temperature stand out as key uh, regulators, although not always by a direct action. This is something that can be seen in the literature. For instance, temperature activates each shock protein that are known to activate PER2 transcription. Conversely, melatonin is a regulator involved in mostly the worst models. And this is something uh, that comes as a validation of our approach because the gene expression that we used are, is, comes from the liver and hepatocyte cells do not uh, possess any uh, melatonin receptors. So any model involving melatonin that would have obtained good performances would have been the result of a spurious correlation. So far, to come up with these results, we did not use the information that we have multiple mouse class. Indeed, for a fixed two-term model, we obtained different regulator weights for each mouse class. Moreover, since we fitted for each two-term model multiple residuals, we can actually compute class-wise regulator weight distributions and then compare this distribution for a fixed model across the class. Let's do that now. What you are looking at now are the weight distributions for two models, the best one for BIMAL1 and the best one for PER2. If we look at the one for BIMAL1, 
it is composed of an indirect action of food intake and temperature. And the first plot that I'm showing now is the regulator weight for the indirect action of food intake. We see that these distributions can be quite different from one class to another. Typically, between class 1 and class 3, there is next to no overlap. Class 1 and class 3 are female mice, but with different genetic background. So this is a kind of difference that we can observe with this approach. If we look at the PER2 model, the weight distribution associated with uh, the action of food intake seem quite similar class-wise. It is now time to conclude. From a biological point of view, what we did learn today is that conditionally to all hypotheses, it is unlikely that we have a linear control of systemic regulators on either reverb alpha transcription or gene mRNA degradation for both three genes considered. Perhaps the control is not linear, or perhaps we did not measure the right systemic regulators. However, in the case of the control on BML1 and PER2 transcription, food intake and temperature stand out as main actors, as literature already observed. From a perspective point of view, it will now be time to integrate those best regulators models back into our circadian clock ODE model. We could also provide a validation of the approach based on human data. And as a long-term goal, we aim towards personalized chronotherapy. The approach developed today can be called a model learning approach, which enabled us to integrate multi-type data, so at the cellular level, at the systemic level, and to provide a class-wise analysis. In order to do so, we encompass prior knowledge through a systems biology approach with a mechanistic model, and this allows us to provide mechanistic predictions on the unknown parts that we now infer. We could also extend the method to a larger number of variables if we place ourselves in the sparse multitask regression framework. That is it. Thank you for your attention.